welcome to the Recover You podcast with Kyleen and Patrick Terhune. It's here that we talk about sex addiction, betrayal trauma, mental, emotional, and physical health, faith, and anything and everything needed to recover you to your most authentic self that God created you to be. Welcome everyone to another episode. Hello, Patrick. Hello, Kyleen. I have a question for you. Yes. What's your question? What did prehistoric doctors heal? What? Dinosaurs. They get better and better. All right. So this is uh, an experimental episode. Uh, Patrick said, why don't we just free flow? <laughs> yeah. Why don't we just talk? Yeah. So I you know, I think I think the way I would like to start out is uh, I had knee surgery two weeks ago. Let's update everybody. Yeah. So I had a uh, blown out meniscus and we found a surgeon using a special, well, it was his special procedure. I didn't find him using a special procedure, <laughs> but I found this surgeon who uh, would sew it all back together using a his own device and own procedure. And so um, we've mentioned this before that running is very important to me. And I was afraid with the kind of the normal meniscus surgery that they would take a piece out and it would make running harder. And this guy basically said if the if he could get it to work, that that I would be able to run again. Um, but the recovery is much, much uh, longer. So I uh, had surgery two weeks ago yesterday out in California. And I want to say that recovery is going well. And Kyleen, you have been amazing. <laughs> you have actually been very supportive and um, helpful. I mean, there we've gone from periods where I couldn't even get my shoes on. And Kyleen has done that and uh, pants and things like that. So I'm a little bit more mobile now than I was, but um, there's a lot of things I can't do. I'm a pretty active guy, but having to tell myself to to sit, you know, is is hard for me. So, um, but kindly, you've been very wonderful. Thank so you. thank you very much for that. <laughs> so I, it, it would have been a much... Well, I kind of go, what do you expect me to do? <laughs> yeah. you no, know, but I mean, you don't have to, uh, right? You don't, we, yeah. yeah you know, I mean, we, don't, we don't have to do these yeah, things. Yeah. So... Um, but what came up, of course. What, what was interesting is, is you and I, I would say we struggled a little bit over the last probably month or so. And, and, um, we were moving along pretty good. Um, we were going to go into what we called our staycation. And, uh, at the beginning, like the week prior to surgery, then we're going to fly out to California and have the surgery. So, um, I remember coming home that Friday night before from work and I was all excited about the staycation and, and there was some stuff going on. I think you were worried about something. So then it kind of knocked me off a little bit of my excitement. And I think we've just, I think we've misfired. I think we've kind of misfired with each other a lot of the last three, four weeks. And so as I've kind of looked into well, why, you know, we, it kind of came to a head, I guess, this Wednesday, right? We had kind of a, I don't know, I don't want to say a knockdown drag drag out discussion, but I guess it was kind of a drag out discussion. Yeah, I kind of would say that because um, I was telling, I was talking to some of my friends the other Wait, day. Wait, you talked to other people about us? How dare you? This is a very private, oh, never <laughs> mind, sorry. <laughs> right. Uh, no, I mean, we encourage everybody when you're struggling to have your support group and your, your team and your mm -hmm. friends that you reach out to, right? And I did talk to my friends and I was like, man, this was just weird. And I, and you and I talked about this because we do not fight. Like we don't fight. And this is a situation where I was really mad at you to the point where I hung up and you were actually like really mad at me. And that just does not happen in our mm -hmm. relationship. And it really didn't even happen a whole lot during, re during, um, you know, discovery and recovery and all that kind of stuff. So this was just, just felt weird mm -hmm. that we, we were both so activated. And, um, I thought that it was very ironic that it was happening the month that the episodes on communication were being released. <laughs> yeah. So then you have, you know, imposter syndrome and you feel bad that you are, um, you know, you are, talking to people and coaching people and encouraging people. And then all of a sudden the same time you're doing that, you are having a struggle and that just always feels weird. And it, it, and it always has, and it always will. And there's a lot of, um, whenever you are in some sort of leadership position or coaching position, there's that, that always happens, right? Like, well, how can I be a health coach if I occasionally still have digestive issues or how can I, you know, and when you zoom out, that's not really the point, right? Like, right. 
all you have to do is, um, you know, I want my coaches to be a couple steps ahead of me and tell me how they got there. Um, I want them to have a little bit more information than me. I don't expect them to be perfect human beings and never have any struggles. But as the coach, you go, well, I want to be the perfect human being that never has any struggles, right? And so if I upset someone or I do something wrong or um, things aren't going really well, I will heap guilt and shame on myself because I feel like, well, I did something wrong or I am not trying hard enough. All of the, and one of the things I think that happens, especially when you and I, like in situations where you and I have tried so hard through these things is when you're having a particularly difficult day, you go, is everything that I've done so far just a waste of time? Right. 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 And, and it's yeah. not right. Like we're sitting here, we've resolved everything. We feel good. Mm-hmm. Every, you know, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, in the moment, that's kind of where your brain goes. Oh, we've tried so hard. Why are we fighting right now? That's not common. And it almost feels scary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and and I think what, what there's a couple of things I thought through over the course of, of all of this. Um, the first would be, I was more stressed out about the surgery than I thought I was. Normally I'm a guy that's kind of unflappable and things just roll off my back and I go, oh, okay, well, whatever, surgery, surgery, you know, get done. And I was so stressed out to the point, you know, I've never traveled anywhere for surgery in like, it was like a phone consultation with a guy and, and it was just kind of weird. It, it th- There was a, a little bit of unsettling. So like the surgery center we were going to was like on an office floor building in Beverly Hills. And it was really weird. We drove the night before to try to find it. And then we found it, but supposedly you couldn't go in there with me. So I, I had this dream the night before surgery that it was like an organ harvesting thing. And I was going to wake up the next day with a scar on my back, sitting in the tub of ice. Mm-hmm. And so like, I was like, I had really worked. I, I really was fearful of this surgery. And I remember you even, you know, a, you know, asked me like, Hey, are you, uh, um, do you want to even do this? Like you asked me that yeah, the night before surgery. Yeah, yeah. You have a choice. And so, of course, once I got to the surgery center, it was fine. It was all legit and all that stuff. It was an actual surgeon and an actual <laughs> anesthesiologist, you know, and actual IVs and, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so it was, it was there, but, you know, we can really get inside of our heads. And so I think in our relationship, our relational dynamic is in general, I'm the kind of the calm, stoic guy, right? That doesn't have a lot of ups and downs. And that pro- produces somewhat of a bedrock for you that allows you to, to go up and down maybe a little bit more than I do. And that's not a criticism of you. It's just, I think you rely on that. And through this process, you even. That's what say, I'm used to. What you're used to. And then, and then you've also mentioned too, just on that theme that, um, I really, um, always express my emotions. Right. right and so. Right. Yeah. So I have the freedom to do that. And probably your consistency there has given me opportunity to do that. Right, right. So I think I think what happens in, in this particular thing is I was unaware of how stressed out I was. Yeah. And and so I at one point I expressed that to you because we we had a couple of, of individual kind of blow ups through the week prior, even on traveling out there, there was a, a misunderstanding, a miscommunication. And and so I expressed that to you the night before saying, Hey, I was really, I was really, really nervous about this. And so you responded and responded well. Um, but as I look back and I was thinking it through this week, cause you know, it kind of continued, right. You know, we continue to have these things. And so I think, I think there's a, I think the thing that everybody has to remember is you're not going to get everything right. You just aren't. And no human being does. And there are times in your life when you're going to be in a hard spot. And, you know, what does Winston Churchill say? If you're in hell, keep going. You know what I mean? You got to keep going. You got to keep pushing through. And, you know, it's really easy to throw in the towel. And I think we, you know, we, I'm not going to talk about generational things, but, you know, people throw in the towel and they throw in the towel way too easy when things get hard. So what I was able to kind of to, to return to was, hey, at the end of the day, we have made it through a lot of really, really hard things and you don't know where things are going to go. Um, and what messages, because a lot of times we get inside of our heads, we start to receive messages that tell us a story. And that story, it doesn't matter whether uh, in that moment, the message you're receiving in your mind is the message you're receiving. It doesn't mean it's accurate. It doesn't mean 
whatever, but that's the message you're receiving. And so I think what, what I had to continue to do and what you helped me with is the message I was receiving. And I'll just be very candid is that you, you weren't, you didn't really like me. And so, and some of that was born out of like your frustration and, and, and some of the things like I was just trying to, trying to take care of things around the house, but you wanted to spend time with me. So you'd be like, Hey, where are you going? Um, but I would take it as like, like you're upset at me that I'm leaving to go do something that's around the house. You know what I mean? So it's like right. a lot of these different things. And the, and the message that I was receiving was, um, that I was really frustrated about. And we talked about in a couple different scenarios was you, you were communicating to me kind of that I, you were sort of communicating the idea that I don't like you, but w- is what you were receiving. But the way you were saying it to me was, you're not accepting me for who I am. This is just who I almost like it was an identity thing. Mm-hmm. Like you're not accepting my personhood and who I am. And that was super triggering to me the way that you said it. Mm-hmm. Um, because it, the way that you approached it felt very aggressive. Right. That this is like the problem that we're having is just who I am. And if you don't accept it, well, you're not accepting me. Right. As opposed to, Hey, this is something we need to communicate a little more clearly about. And, and ultimately we did. And I think that's a point to bring in here too, is, you know, we did those episodes on communication and stuff. And that's when you're generally speaking, fairly calm and able to kind of um, work through things, sit down and do it intentionally. But sometimes like, this is something that we were committed to the same things, but it did take us several weeks to actually work through. But because we were moving in the same direction and had the same intention, like it did happen. And so working towards that and getting better at communication isn't always like a 15 minute conversation. Right, right. These were several conversations that we had as we tried to communicate how we were feeling and listening to the other person and then expressing I'm, I am or I'm not okay with that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, this whole situation, and this is what's, what's really, you know, another tenant that comes out of this whole situation is, you know, I've been in recovery for a long time and I, I have never relapsed and it's not a, that's not a value judgment on anybody, but who has or whatever. It's just, you know, it's been my, my healing path, but, um, the recovery process can wear you down. Yeah. It very much can. And sometimes you're not aware that it's wearing you down. It's not always roses every single day. Um, and it's okay to say at times I'm tired mm-hmm. and both parties can take a message from mm-hmm. various reactions that like, um, so like, here's a good example. If I say I'm emotionally tired, I can't put effort into this right now. Mm-hmm. You may receive it as you've given up. And you're moving on. I'm like, and that's not at all what I was yeah, saying. That, it's just that's, like that's exactly when we were talking the other night. Like yeah. the message I was sort of subliminally receiving or interpreting right. myself, the, the story that I was creating out of it mm-hmm. was that you're giving up and that you don't have hope. And you were just saying that you were tired, which I get because I was like, welcome, welcome to my recovery journey, right? Like this right. whole process has been a yeah. thing. Yeah, me. exactly. Um, and and so I was it was what what going back to what you were originally saying, though, your consistency in um you know, having that hope and having that energy is something I've gotten used to. And so to struggle in a way where you started to feel fatigued about it and overwhelmed really threw me for a loop. Mm -hmm. So then I did kind of on some level interpret that as like, are we splitting up? Like, is this the end? Like, can we keep going? Right. And we didn't really get to that point. No. Um, but it was sort of that's the underlying message that is making you insecure and feel more yeah. triggered by the conversation itself. Right. 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 Yeah. And and what's what's really crazy is you as you go through these things, sometimes I mean, when when you talk about splitting up, it's such a taboo thing to say. Some people throw it around way too much. You know, if we can't get if we can't, you know, I'm yeah, just and you work. shouldn't do that. But, you know, it's it's okay to talk about it. It's okay to talk about how you're feeling, you know, and, and I kept kind of telling myself, I'm like, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to communicate how I'm feeling. And so, but that's a learned skill. It's not something that you just go snap your fingers and say, I'm in recovery. So now I'm the best communicator too. And I'm the best this and I'm the best that. And, you know, one of the, as they talk about the amount of time it takes to to, to grow in recovery, 
you know, the notion of three to five years and we're right at two and a half. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're not at three and, you know, we we're half of five. Um, The reason it takes so long is you have to experience these things. You're Mm going to go through a death in the family. You're going to go through a maybe a pet you have to put down. You're going to go through a misunderstanding. You're going to go through, um, I mean, misfires in communication. You know what I mean? Like, and and I know because the 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 knee thing was really bothering me. Mm -hmm. It was really in my mind. But I think I approached it the way I've always approached everything else. You, know, you put your head down and you keep moving through it. It's not really it. But I didn't realize how much it was right. impacting so it was, my... Yeah, like on the staycation, basically, you were super stressed right. and agitated and irritable. And it was kind of, you didn't really recognize what that was coming from until... It was almost over, really. Right. We kind of right. were, we're, yeah. were like, oh, this is I mean, ideally, <laughs> yeah, I mean, ideally, you know, I would have said to you at the time, hey, I'm feeling really stressed about this. This right. is not your fault. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to work through this. And if I'm a little bit short, please forgive me. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, ideally, that that's what you do, right? right? And then you can say, hey, how can I help? And, right. and stuff like that. But, you know, life doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? All of a sudden, these things just happen. And then you have to kind of do a little bit of repair mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But it was it was really interesting as I thought through. And, and, and you know, I'll give my perspective of it. But, you know, as, as we resolve things on Wednesday, I was like, you know, we both want the same thing. And you even said this. You said, um, I don't know if I can navigate the line between the fear of you relapsing and then what was it? The fear of, I think, you know, you stopping loving me or something like that or leaving. Right. And I was like like, putting in all this work and then having you go, I'm done. And so, so it's crazy is I was like, this is probably one of the more stressful times during recovery other than like discovery and Mm -hmm. all of the craziness that came with that. It was heavy, but I never, like, it was never a thought. Right. Like, well, I'm going to go relapse, you know, or anything like that. It was never, I was always in recovery. It was just, well, it is interesting because we've gotten to a point where that wasn't the primary fear Mm -hmm. for me. I wasn't afraid necessarily that you were going to relapse. It was more a fear of separation uh, or, or inability to work it out because it felt so different Mm -hmm. than the way we have communicated in the past. Yeah. yeah. And so that was just, it was very interesting. It was, um, it it just felt very heavy and very Mm -hmm. stressful um, because normally we do such a good job about empathizing and, and saying, Oh, this is how you feel. And, and, and even if we disagree, typically getting over it fairly quickly, but these, these were, um, this conversation was almost like, um, you know, I, I'm drawing a line in the sand and okay, well, I'm drawing a line in the sand and well, we disagree. And, yeah, and we yeah. really, I mean, it's so few and far between that we have those types of disagreements. Right. 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 And, and, you know, and that's why it feels unsettling. Yeah. It's very unfamiliar. Right. And I, and I often think about this, you know, I think of my parents who were married 49 years and, you know, they didn't have a perfect marriage, but, and there was a lot of stuff that I witnessed that was really hard. And your parents have been married in their forties, right. The, the amount of years that they've, they've been together. And, and I know there's been disagreements in those and hard disagreements and things like that. And so, you know, I think, I think, you know, tough times create, if you work through them, tough times create good things. And so you have to remember that, you know, is it nice? Yeah, I guess that's why they call it the honeymoon phase, right? Um, you know, the honeymoon phase does end and then life happens. And then when something like this comes up or something else or, or whatever it may be, it's going to test your ability to get things communicated. And, you know, however you do it, like you talked about talking to your friends or reflecting or spending some quiet time, like, can you get yourself back to the basic fundamental of what you believe? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, in my mind, the basic fundamental was, you know, I deeply love you. I, I'm committed to this relationship and making it work and understanding. And, and like, I think there's a couple of times where you're like, well, I just think you're really mad at me. I was never <laughs> mad at you. Like I was literally never mad at you. Well, I was just, you know, at one point, I, I think there's, for sure were. there's like, there's like frustration with an action. Yeah. And then there's mad. And I think the mad in my I mind. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know you were mad. Yeah. You get, you get mad at me all the time. No. Anyway, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but you know, like, like it was, it was just, you know, frustration because it was like, mm-hmm. I don't know what else to do. I have really worked hard. I don't know what else I can do. That's I how feel, I felt. I feel like we were know? both kind of thinking at the same time, right? Yeah. Like we yeah. both put so much into this. Right. right. 
And, and occasionally it gets so exhausting. You go, I've put so much into this. Where's the reward. Yeah. Right. And, and we talked about that too. It's like, I want, and we don't want to discourage people listening to this either, because I guess at the end, we'll kind of talk about, um, there certainly is the reward. Yeah. Um, but, but I think in the moments, and, and I'm sure you've all experienced this in the moments of sadness or in the moments of stress, those seem to take over to the point where you don't see the other parts that have been good. Right. And you go, well, the sad part or this angry part or this frustration or this fatigue, that's been like the past two and a half years. You're right. like, actually, there's been a lot of good in the past yeah, two and a half absolutely, years. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, but, but I think that's kind of when you hit that point at the same time together, then it feels very exhausting. Usually, and this is, I think, part of what played into it. Usually, it's one of us at a time. Mm-hmm. I'll be sad and frustrated, and you'll be like, "No, we can do it. It's totally fine. Let's just like focus yeah. on this over here." Right. Or it, then you'll be kind of frustrated about something, and I'll and I'll be towing the line and saying, "No, it's totally okay. Like I've got you. Right? We're good." What was different about this is we were both exhausted and frustrated at the same time. Mm-hmm. And that really just felt draining. Right. Well, and, and there's a couple of things as I thought through that Wednesday after we had kind of worked through it. There's a couple of things and you and I had talked about it the night before too. Like, you know, we go through a period of time and we are in therapy and then we're, we feel like we're okay. And maybe it's time to go back and get a little bit more help. So, mm-hmm. you know, you, we talked about you going back to therapy a little bit. I have actually signed back up and I think it had been February was the last time I had actually gone to therapy or March or something like that. So I'm just going to go back. And, and then we also talked about regenerating the nightly check-in. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, you know, there's the, the nice thing with the nightly check-in and this is what's crazy is it has a thing in there. What do you appreciate about yeah. the other partner? And, and that I, was kind of what you were feeling is like, yeah. I wasn't appreciating you. Right. Or right. I didn't like you. Yeah. So I was, I got so upset by that too. Cause I was like, are you kidding me? I wouldn't have gone through all this if I didn't like you. No, and, and <laughs> right? that's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. And so it's like, it, it's, but you know, li- life is hard. Yeah. Li- life is very hard. I mean, how many, you know, people, you know, in sibling relationships, you know, they know their siblings love each other, but man, sometimes you can't be in the same room right. with them and stuff like that. And so it's just, you know, when, when you, you can't spend that much time with somebody and and we've talked about this as well. We always have to be careful because, you know, your job is to work with with the betrayed. Mm-hmm. So you're hearing these stories over and over. We do a podcast where we talk about betrayal. You know, we talk, you know, and we and you always have to kind of say, hey, what is our self-care plan? All right, and are we doing a good job of that? And mm-hmm. so, like, you know, and I think that's partially what happened with my knee because my self-care is exercise. My self-care is running. Mm-hmm. I said, well, that's off the table. Mm-hmm. And so it changes you know, your ability. So, but self-care is also hanging out with people other than your spouse, mm-hmm. right? In a, in a positive way, right? Well, so, that, yeah. that, had, that came up too for me because the idea, it was really hitting me that it's not really you um, that's going to make or break my happiness, right? This relationship right. is not what makes me happy or not. It's how I spend my time during the day and what relationships and what activities I engage in. Uh, Because if I have a fulfilled, happy life, then, you know, we, we can have these ups and downs and and essentially I feel stable. And I did a lot of work through recovery to get to the point where I was like, I like myself. I'm going to be fine, whether we stay together or whether we separate. Um, Mm -hmm. And that took a lot of work. And I think this sort of reiterated you know, maybe that's not a uh, one and done thing. That that's maybe right. that is yeah. a you know an ongoing thing where you have to invest in the other relationships in your life. You need to spend time um, you know, going and doing activities that you enjoy and all this kind of stuff, and uh, kind of taking stock. Like if you're not feeling fulfilled in some way during the first year of recovery, I think there's a lot where you can quote unquote blame what's going on hundred mm-hmm. percent. I think at a certain point, and that timeline is probably going to be different for everyone, but at a certain point, it's, that's not the thing that is really triggering the unhappiness anymore. Right. Um, and we all have to kind of take a look and say, are there things that I'm doing or not doing as an individual that are, fulfilling or not fulfilling my life. And at Mm -hmm. this point, am I not engaging in the right relationships or the right activities or the right things that fill my cup so that I can then show up and feel like I'm participating in the world. Right. Right. And, and that I'm happy. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and if you're putting all of your happiness into a relationship that is difficult 
Right. Right. And re- highly rewarding and beneficial, but also because of what you've been through, difficult, then that's going to be really tough. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, as we were talking, I was like, you know, you deserve to be happy. I deserve to be happy. And we have to find that happiness on our own in a complimentary way. Um, Mm -hmm. We can support each other and we can have a happy, loving marriage um, based on the foundation of individual happiness. And so I think I think that's a uh, that's been a a learning process because it's like, well, why do I need validation from you? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And but we're human beings. We we want that. You know, well, we, humans yeah. need community in general. Right. We right. we need connection with other people. And the person you are most connected to is your spouse. Yeah. So you're going to want those things. You're going to want validation. You're going to want affirmation. You're going to want to do the activities with that person primarily, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to want to spend time and fun and, and engagement with that person, right? But but just being careful and aware that it is important to have a life outside or an identity outside of your spouse, right? right? Like who am I as a human being and are there areas of my life? um, And, you know, there's the, I'm not sure what it's called, but it's like, it's like the life wheel where you divide it up. It's like a pie and you divide it up into little sections and it's like health, spirituality, um, hobbies, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, different types of things like that work, uh, you know, relationships, stuff like that, um, career. And you look at that as your personhood and say, where in, in what area, you know, are the numbers pretty high? I feel pretty good here. I pretty yeah. feel pretty fulfilled here. And in what areas are really low. Right. Right. And, and your, your relationship with your spouse could be one of those, but just realizing that in totality, that's only one piece of it. Mm-hmm. That's not actually, you know, what's going to make or break you right, and right. your like your satisfaction with life day to day. And so I think sometimes like my tendency, I just totally honest um, and not like in a codependent way, just I really like spending time with you. My tendency would be that I put all of the eggs in the basket of spending time with you and doing all the activities mm-hmm. with you. And so I do have to be conscientious about doing other things. And I, and I do find that, um, I'm sure you found this too. When I am, when I, when my schedule is busier and when I'm working with more clients and when I'm engaged with my friends mm-hmm. and when I have more activities, just, I feel better. Oh, of course. Yeah. 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 Like I always, you know, I, I went to West Point. And so when I have the opportunity to go spend time with my West Point classmates and friends, it really fills my tank. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, like my brother and I are going to San Diego, that's going to make me feel good. You know what I mean? I'm going to be able to, 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 to have fun with him and stuff like that. And it's not in it having fun with somebody else. Doesn't take in away. a non-threatening way. Yeah. Doesn't take away, you know. And so it, it's, you know, it, having it, fun with a uh, safe people. That's what I'm, <laughs> you know, it, yeah. I said in a safe way. You know, it's it, it's you know in in, in an appropriate way right. does not take away from the relationship. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we you have to I think constantly evaluate. Do I need to be back in therapy? Do I need more help? Um, is there something that's coming up that's keeping me stuck? We've talked about keeping you know staying stuck. Is there something that that I am projecting onto my spouse, even though he betrayed me, but he's there that I need to work on still that I need some help working through. Same thing with me on the recovering side. Like, have I developed a, a sense of resentment for something like that, that I need some guidance through? That's, that's what a therapist and a coach does is, is they, they help you. They sit there and they're uninterested. They don't really care who you are. I mean, they care, but they don't care who you are. They hear your story and they've heard lots of stories like you and they say, have you thought about this? Let's process this. Why don't we work through this? And so that's really, really powerful. And sometimes you just can't get there on your own. You well, know? and I think this is kind of all tying into the idea of taking personal responsibility for your healing and for your growth. Right. And so that is choosing not to not to always blame what is happening on the addiction. Mm-hmm that may be a part of the reason you feel the way you feel, or it may be something that has escalated why you feel the way you feel. But there, again, at different phases of your relationship, uh, there have been many times where throughout this process, I've said, no, you are checking every single box. This issue that we're coming up against at this point is my own. You have said that. Yeah. This is something that I 
know that I need to work on and it is an internal conflict that I have. It is not because of anything that you are currently doing. And did the betrayal exacerbate it? Maybe, but maybe it was there before. Mm -hmm. Um, And in a lot of cases for me, that is true. There were, there were a lot of things that were there before that just came to the surface. And so there have been several times where I go, this is what I'm struggling with. This is how I feel. It's very easy for you to then go, well, that's because I did X, Y, Z. And I've told you, no, actually, at this point, it, it's really not your behavior. It's actually my insecurity or my fear. And so I think that goes into like being willing to take the responsibility for the healing. Um, because again, and we talked about this, whether you stay together or whether you um, separate, it is that self-reflection that's going to allow you to move forward. You and, know, as you were saying this, and I remember this was coming to mind, I re- and I've said this to you, I was like, if if my fundamental belief in that moment of crisis was that you didn't particularly care for me, and I also want you to be very happy, then what happens, right? You know, what happens in your mind, it starts to drive you towards a, a particular decision or whatever. You know, you kind of say, hey, I, I I want, you know, I want you to be happy. You deserve to be happy. I deserve to be happy. You don't like me. And so where does that leave us? You know, and, and just so, to clarify for everybody, I do like Patrick. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, but no, she does. And and so there's been a lot of things that, that, you know, she demonstrates on a regular basis. And, and, and I think you're right. It's we as human beings, and it's the notion of trauma. What, what we do from a traumatic standpoint is we project onto ourselves, you know, what the impact of what people say or how people act mm-hmm. And it hurts us individually. And many times it's not about us. It's not, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the child that feels unloved because their father doesn't come home and play with them. It might be that the father came home, wants to play with the child, has a migraine, needs to lay down, but it's still, it doesn't matter at that point. The child is still receiving that message. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's, you know, it's, it, it's, that's the notion of, of trauma and you've got to work really hard. So I guess, you know, the, the, if I was to wrap up everything and we may not be done with this podcast, but, but, um, to wrap it up is, you know, things are hard and, um, have a vision. I think through this process, we even talked about having a vision. What's our vision? You know, do, is our vision that we're going to be vacationing together in exotic fun places in 10 years? Because that could sustain you versus, how are we going to get through the end of the day? Mm-hmm. You know, the, it, mm-hmm. sometimes you become too short term mm-hmm. and that, you know, a vision helps keep you moving in a direction when things are hard mm-hmm. because you know, it's the light there that you're moving towards. And, you know, it doesn't matter if there's rats in the tunnel or whatever, you're going to continue to move forward towards your, your, your vision destination. Yeah. I was going to kind of say something similar in that I think how do you move through these things is when you ultimately share the same goal. And so if, if maybe that hasn't been verbalized or that isn't something that you guys are clear on, I think that could be really helpful. Right. And, um, you know, if you guys want to do like a couple's values elicitation session with me, I'll put a a link in the show notes to do that, where we can talk about what your values are as individuals and how you can align those as a couple, because that could be really helpful to kind of come up with this. But, um, but yeah, creating that vision, like maybe the goal is, you know, we have really held from the beginning, our goal was emotional intimacy with each other. And we assumed that everything would fall into place because of that. And I, and I think that is valid. And I think that that is true. And I think because we held to that and we went very slowly with the goal of achieving that, that it has moved us in a very positive direction and that we are, we are seeing the results from that Mm -hmm. as opposed to bypassing it or forcing something or, you know, those types of things. Um, so I think you do have to have the same goal and just make sure that you feel like you are able to communicate it and be heard on it and, and that you agree on it. But then I, we've also talked about liking the other person and obviously you questioned that the past couple of weeks. Um, mm-hmm. but I do think just, you know, again, I think that was like you were saying trauma related. It's not necessarily that I don't like you. Right. And so we've made it very clear. I, one of the things that has sustained us is that we both really like each other as people. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think that is another thing that plays in having the same goal, really liking um, each other as human beings 
and really wanting the best for the other person. Like I want you to be happy. You want me to be happy, that sort of thing. You want the best outcome for the other person. And then the final thing that I think really kind of gets you through almost anything, almost anything is the, the commitment to communication because what was happening was we were really frustrated and struggling, but we kept talking about it. We kept Mm -hmm. talking about it. We kept talking until we were able to get to the point where we figured it out. Mm -hmm. Right. And so just keep keeping that door open and feeling safe enough in your relationship that you can keep that conversation open until it is resolved. And you, and you know, that as a couple, like that's your commitment, that is going to be ultimately beneficial in terms of I mean, really working through almost anything because most of the time these are going to be like what, what was happening with us was kind of miscommunication or misunderstandings or assumptions or stories that we were making in our head about what the other person was thinking. And when we were able to communicate thoroughly enough about it, we were able to come the other side and we've been, you know, great since then. And yeah. actually I think yeah. Ultimately, I think it was incredibly beneficial because I, you know, in a weird sort of way, I think it did help pull down more walls, more boundaries, right. open up more vulnerability, um, in, you know, take you to that next level of connection. Mm-hmm. And so I would say that in kind of any aspect of healing where it starts to get hard, instead of shying away from that, really, really dig into it and commit to getting through it because it is on the other side of that difficult process, whatever it is, if it's communicating, if it's going to a coach, if it's mm-hmm. going to a group, if it's um, really working through um, connection with each other, whatever it is, it's on the opposite side of that, that you then go, oh, now I see why that had to come up. And for us too, why it had to come up now, right? Right. As right. opposed to year one yeah. or year two, right? Yeah. And so I think that is kind of going back to your original point early on was the reason quote unquote full recovery i th- i think it's lifelong you know don't put a timeline on it yeah. but the reason they say full recovery is like 2 to 5 years 3 to 5 years is because these things happen over time mm-hmm. there is a huge component that time plays in your recovery where you just can't get it all in in a year you can get into sobriety mm-hmm. you can get into sexual recovery right very right. quickly yeah but in terms of rebuilding the trust and deepening the communication and really getting to a place that is even more vulnerable and stronger than before the the discovery, that takes yeah. a lot of time and time plays a big part. I just thought of this. So I've been in, in leadership roles most of my life and I teach leadership and things like that. I would never tell somebody it takes two to five years to learn to be a good leader. And because you you don't know what situation you're going to be exposed to. And so that's why you need good mentors in your life. That's why you need um, the ability to reflect and to look at things with good critical logical reasoning. You need to have good Mm self-care once again, because in no matter what your leadership journey, you're going to have different people. You're going to have different challenges. You may have COVID come in. You may have a power outage. You may have shortage of parts. You may have Mm -hmm. a tough physical altercation at work. I mean, these are all things that come up it doesn't matter. It doesn't all come up in your first mm-hmm. two to five years of being a leader. And so I think back through my my 30 years since college of being a, a leader. I mean, I've learned things over those 30 years that other people haven't learned and vice versa. Mm-hmm. So that's why, you know, as you as you level up in life, this is a leveling up mm-hmm. type of thing. You know, you, you don't want to be back into the behavior of, of objectifying people. Mm-hmm. But there's deep human wounds that are in there that have led to that and that you've created mm-hmm. and that it takes time to continue to work through that. Your patterns are still going to be there. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? The the sense that you're unlovable, the, you know, it, it may be less and less and less and less, but you could still that, get That could be, you, you'd get, get triggered back into that. You get activated on that again. Yeah. And, and, you know, and all of a sudden, once you're activated, That's the default. you go down that path again. And so... You know, that's why it it takes time, you know, so being able to pull yourself out of that, rely on other people, focus on some ways to move forward and then recognize where you need some help is all right. part of becoming, you know, more and more in recovery and healing. Well, and I think what every human being is looking for is stability mm-hmm. in their life and consistency in their life. And so when you have something like, addiction and betrayal and um, discovery kind of blow up the relationship. 
things like this, the reason it was scary is because it feels like it was threatening that stability and that consistency. Yep. Yep. And so the counter to that is the uh, is is the deep commitment to communication to keep going until you understand what's happening. Right. Right. And because if we had stopped this conversation or this this sharing our feelings about this day one or even week one mm-hmm. as we were kind of navigating it, this it may not have ended up in a positive no, place. No, not at all. But the relent, I'm going to say relentless, the relentless dedication we have to talking it out mm-hmm. and to figuring it out and to be willing to be seen and heard by the other person, even when what you're sharing is scary and feels very vulnerable Mm -hmm. and vice versa, doing that both directions. Ultimately, I think that's what allows you to kind of get through these. And that's kind of what we've figured out. I agree. I agree. So I guess the, the lesson would be is, Hey, keep going. If you, you know, if you, if you both deeply care for each other and there's, there's a mutual, uh, agreement of where you want to go keep going Mm -hmm. and and i and then the other part to that is it's not always going to be easy and you know when when you hit these moments really work through them yeah because we don't want to put like a fake right image on it right like well after the first year of your recovery and everything's been great and you know we never have any ups and downs anymore it it is it is still a journey and i think it will be for a long time um and we have I, like I said, it's like every time we go through that, the other side is like, oh, we've up leveled again and, and this yeah. feels better and we feel more connected. And this is, we have grown. It was a growth period. And sometimes the things that feel the scariest end up giving you the most growth and development. And ultimately that's what we're looking for in life and in relationships is to go through those experiences so that we can become better people and learn from them. And I think that is what all of, I think that's what this whole process has allowed us to do over yeah. over time. Absolutely. And, and, and even though it doesn't feel good in the moment, it offers those benefits in the end. Like a workout. It doesn't <laughs> feel good in the moment, but then you get a benefit. Yes. This recovery has been an intense workout. That's right. That's right. Yep. All right. That sounds good. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. If you found this podcast interesting or helpful, it would mean so much if you leave a five-star review or post a screenshot and share on social media. We are on a mission to share the message of recovery and you can help get the word out. If you know a friend who could use this podcast, please share it.